The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Well, welcome to worship on this, another Lord's Day. But on our calendars, uh, it says that it is another day. It is Father's Day. And so as we begin our worship, let us pray for those fathers uh, that are involved in our lives. Let us pray. We give you uh, our thanks, Father God, for our fathers. Uh, fatherhood does not come with a manual, and, uh, and reality teaches us that some fathers excel while others fail. We ask for your blessings for them all and forgiveness where it is needed. This Father's Day, we remember the many sacrifices fathers make for their children and families. and the ways, both big and small, they lift children to achieve dreams thought beyond reach. So too, we remember all those who have helped fill the void when fathers pass early or are absent. Grandfathers and uncles, brothers and cousins, teachers, pastors and coaches, and the women of our families. For those who are fathers, we ask for wisdom and humility. And in the face of the task of parenting, give them the strength to do well by their children and by you. In your holy name, O God, we pray. Amen. Let us begin our worship with these words of invitation. In the midst of life's storms, God is there. What have we to fear? In the darkness and terror, God is with us. Of whom shall we be afraid? Rise up, people of God, for you are loved and saved. Thanks be to God who cares deeply for us. Amen. Let us say words of confession and receive words of forgiveness. 
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let us pray. O God of creation, eternal majesty, you preside over land and sea, sunshine and storm. By your strength, pilot us. By your power, preserve us. By your wisdom, instruct us. And by your hand, protect us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, Then ye shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now Saul and Jesse's sons and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. David heard him. David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, 
You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. uh, Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones from the wadi, and put them in his shepherd's bag, in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David, with a shield-bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come with me, come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to this Philistine, You come to me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all, may, all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into your hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. When evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, Do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. A faithful God, speak to our hearts with grace and truth, so that we may know your faithfulness toward us, and respond with lives oriented toward your will and your ways. Amen. Well, few stories capture our imagination like the story of David and Goliath. You know the story. It is, it is familiar. Uh, if you've gone to Sunday school, uh, you've probably heard it throughout your Sunday school years and in the odd sermon. We've seen it in movies. It's been written about in books. So we know the scene. We have these two armies facing off. 
Uh, the, the idea in the story is that both sides put forth their most fearsome warriors for a battle that will decide which side will serve the other. In this case, the Philistines, they have a giant. Uh, the Israelites, well, uh, they don't really have anyone. Everyone is scared. Everyone is hiding. They are hiding helplessly behind rocks a safe distance away. Uh, the Israelite army is hiding with their human king and leaders. The same king they chose because they wanted to be like everybody else. To have someone who would fight for us, they said. But we know how the story ends. As David, the unlikely hero, armed merely with a slingshot and, and some river stones, brings about the demise of this terrible Philistine giant. So the theme of this encounter between David and Goliath continues in a similar way as last week um, as we ask the question, what really matters? Last week we heard that God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. In our world, size matters, strength matters, physical ability matters. And as much as we idolize youthfulness, age or stature measured in years also matters to us. But does it matter to God? What is this story trying to reveal to us? Uh, one popular way of looking at the story is to look at it uh, kind of like a morality tale. What does the story of David and, and, and Goliath have to teach us? What is the moral of the story? So think of stories like the, the, the tortoise and the hare, right? Recounting the road race between a rabbit and a turtle, Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare teaches children to keep trying and not to brag. The moral of the story. Or how about the boy who cried wolf? The boy who cried wolf is a story about a boy who falsely accuses a wolf of trying to get his sheep. And when a wolf really does come, no one believes him. And so this, this story teaches honesty. Or what about the lion and the mouse? The lion and the mouse uh, tells the story of a lion with a thorn in his paw, which the mouse removes. So the moral teaches children that no matter how small they are, they can still help others. We can tend to moralize the story of David and uh, defeating Goliath and uh, try to find the lesson in it for us. What does it have to teach us? Like what are the five smooth stones in your life that will take down the giants that are trying to keep you from success? Or, or uh, who or what are the giants in your life that need to be removed in order for you to achieve your full potential? If we read this story like a morality tale, I believe that we miss the point. Right? What if we hear this story another way? This seems to be a story about an underdog. And the thing about the underdog is that the outcome of the story is something that we never saw coming. Now, why do we love underdog stories so much? I like a good underdog story, right? An underdog is someone who is expected to lose. Uh, they aren't strong enough, or they aren't talented enough, or they aren't good enough. Uh, we live in a world that isn't just, but we want the world to be just. Uh, we won't we don't want to get our hopes up too much but we want to see this underdog succeed uh, but yet this story about David and, and Goliath is is more than simply another underdog victory we have a fresh picture of bold and courageous faithfulness of God 
as reflected in David. The faithfulness of God. Uh, this story is what theologians call a type or shadow of how God ultimately works in the world through Jesus. David goes out on behalf of God's people who are hiding, who are helpless, vulnerable, and weak. And Goliath represents the fear, uh, the evil, and the chaos in the world. Enemies of God and enemies of God's people. David goes out in foolishness and weakness, not with tools of war, but with a stick, some stones, and a heart of faith. Uh, David is mocked and, and looked at with disdain, but, uh, but David delivers a blow to Goliath and removes his head. The enemy has been slain. But this story isn't about taking down the Goliaths in your life. This is about the one who would come from the family of David, uh, Jesus, who in his foolishness and weakness, um, and, while, and while we are held captive to the enemies of God's people, sin, death, and the devil, this Jesus, David's greater son, who goes out by himself in the foolishness and weakness of the cross, he takes on the enemies of God's people. St. Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Jesus conquers the enemies of sin and death and the devil by virtue of his rising from death. We who are God's people, completely helpless, receive the benefits of that victory, of God's love and grace and mercy which completely covers us not because we've done any great slaying of giants but because Jesus has the same Jesus who in our gospel reading calms the storm on the sea Jesus reveals his power over evil since the sea represents chaos and evil the boat on the sea is a symbol of the church and invites us to trust God in the midst of life's uh, troubles and turbulence. We can trust in God because of what Jesus has done for us. So this is what the story reveals to us. That sometimes it is in the form of the least expected, the underdog, even through a shepherd boy or a baby in a manger, that God works. The way God works in our lives may not be the way that we expect God to work in our lives. We may never see it coming. Yet we are called to have hope in difficult times, in the chaos of our lives, even though we may not see God at work until it comes upon you, when the storm is eventually calmed. So what matters is trusting in the one who has proven faithful to us. David goes out and encounters Goliath, not based on his own abilities, but because he trusts in the one who has shown himself to be faithful to David. The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of this Philistine, David says. David doesn't confront Goliath trusting in his own abilities to slay the giants in his own life. But David does uh, trust in the Lord as he goes to Goliath. So let us not misread the story. It is not about being a David uh, in order to defeat your Goliath because you have such a strong faith. No, it is, it is about Jesus, who defeats the Goliath. Jesus, who has saved us from the paw of sin, the paw of death, and the paw of the devil. Let us place our faith and trust in Jesus, who is faithful to his promises to us. Jesus, who calms our fears. Jesus, who calms 
our chaos. Amen. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the Triune God in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wondrous works to all your children. You hold power over wind and waves, sin and death. Deliver us from every trouble and distress, and bring us at last to our our eternal haven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of our salvation, let your grace be proclaimed through every hardship, struggle, and suffering, 
and encourage us by the example of many saints to consider ourselves rich and alive despite every opposition. For since we have Christ, we possess everything. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, open wide the hearts of Christians to one another, especially within the home and between neighbors. Let love be genuine, speech truthful, and patience constant. Let us commend ourselves in everything as those known by God's love and therefore unashamed to serve one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you rule this world by your power. You keep watch over all nations. We pray for countries experiencing violence, hunger, and unrest. Guide worldwide and local community organizations in their effort to establish safety and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, you see that we are perishing, yet you bid us to set our fears aside and trust in you for the sake of Christ, by whose blood we have received peace for our troubled consciences. Do not reject our prayers for their faithlessness, but teach us to trust in you fully. Give your protection and peace to all who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your love endures in all situations. On this Father's Day, we pray for those who are fathers or wish to be fathers, for those with broken or strained relationships, for those who are missing their fathers, and for our fathers who have lost children. Bless and strengthen them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. These and whatever else you would have us ask of you, O God, grant us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lead us into your kingdom and teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face uh, toward you and give you his peace. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.